If you want to build a SaaS pricing model, there are three high-level revenue components that you want to take into account. These are non-recurring transactional type fees, flat fees, and metric-based fees. Each of them breaks into three additional sub-components, but I'm going to go through all nine and show you the pros and cons, both from a functional and also psychological perspective. Now, transactional non-recurring fees. These are the fees that you charge on your customer once, not on a recurring basis for services or product delivered and never charged again. Generally, they break into either the fees that come before the solution begins, during the customer's lifetime with your solution, or at the end of the customer's lifetime with your solution. So we call them start fees, exit fees, or intermediate fees. Now, start fees can be charges for onboarding the customer, for integrating the customer, for some sort of bespoke development that is set up to get the customer onto your solution. The pros of starting fees are you get the cash up front, the customer actually commits to your solution, meaning also that if they pay, let's say, 25,000 to onboard to your solution, their adoption behavior after paying this money is likely it's going to be a little bit better than if they paid zero. The drawbacks, of course, is that it puts a threshold, an entry barrier to the customer adopting the solution. So if you say, well, it costs 25,000 to get started, the customer might think twice. During the customer's lifetime, you can also add similar types of fees. These can be for additional integrations, additional development, training for certifications, for all of the things that aren't delivered on a recurring basis, but that the customer actually needs and that you can and will deliver as part of your relationship with them. This is a really good, fair, simple, and easy exchange of value between you and your customer. And actually on a general level, I recommend it quite a bit. At the end, you have exit fees that are charges you put on your customer to get them out of your product, out of the solution for one reason or another. So these can be offboarding fees. And these can be data migration fees to take all the data and push them out. These can be counting loss of some sort of credit that they had built up in their account, which they now forfeit or lose because they don't continue with your solution. So exit based fees are not usually a focus, but they can work in the sense that, for example, they cover your actual cost of getting out of a software, which also means that they communicate your commitment and your cost to your customer of what it means to be engaged with the two of you. So exit based fees can work as a churn prevention mechanism, as a way for you to mitigate costs, as a way for you to cover some cash flows and so forth. Generally, it doesn't have the largest psychological impact on the relationship because it comes so late, it doesn't affect a lot of decisions, but it can postpone churn a little bit. And for that reason, it might help. Now, Flat fees, some fee that you charge on a recurring basis, so every month, every quarter, every year, whatever it is, that is not dependent on some size or volume of something else. So it is not per user or per gigabyte or per API call. Flat fees essentially are a license in the sense that I charge you X dollars, $5,000 per month for access to this functionality, regardless of how much you use it, how many use it, and so forth. So, the first version of flat fee is simply what we call a basic subscription fee. So this is just money that you ask your customer to pay to get access to the solution, regardless of their product selection. So this can be the basic fee that you put on your basic tier. It can be sometimes we call it platform fees, any of the sort. In addition to basic subscription fees, you can also have non-optional flat fees. So these are flat fees that you ask the customer to pay, but they don't get a choice of whether or not to pay them. So this could, for example, be a third party license. So a data license, for example, or an integration fee to let's say another third party or another piece of software that is mandatory for the use of the solution of the product but that you choose to describe in a separate line item and a separate charge to the customer so the benefit of a non-optional flat fee is that you get to communicate that exact value to the customer and maybe you also get to communicate the cost that you incur that you ask the customer to pay which increases their sense of fairness of why they have to pay it so if i say well platform is five thousand dollars a month but you have to pay an additional one thousand dollars a month for this third-party data source that i'm bringing to the table over here which costs me a thousand dollars a month the customer is very likely to say well the thousand dollars a month that you charge me for the third party data source is fair game. I'm not going to negotiate that. Maybe they want to negotiate the core 5,000 that you have in your flat subscription fee, but the added thousand from the third party, they don't want to negotiate because they have a high sense of fairness. They know you're paying it. This actually makes it more defensible in a negotiation standpoint when you're trying to execute your pricing towards your customer. So this is why we actually separate these basic subscription fees from the non-optional flat fees. The third kind of flat fee is the optional flat fee. So this is the kind of flat fee that the customer chooses to incur based on their product selection. So this could be, well, I would like that third-party data source. It's not mandatory, 
but it's beneficial to me. It brings me value and I want to pull it in. So flat fees here can be a good source of revenue and pricing description for these kinds of added purchases. Now, in general, flat fees have a few functions that you want to be aware of. First, they set a minimum threshold, a minimum standard of the size of the customer that you want to allow into the solution. So if you charge $5,000 a month, you're implicitly saying, if you don't want to pay me $60,000 a year to be a customer of this solution, we should stop talking. There is no beneficial commercial relationship for us because this is the minimum level of business I will accept from a customer. So this really sort of removes the low quality or low paying customers and allows you to focus on the high value customers that your solution is built for. The second benefit is that the flat fees actually create an implicit discount model in your pricing model. So let's assume that you're charging $5,000 a month and you're charging $100 per user. So you're combining a flat fee with a metric based model. Now, if my customer only has one user, they're going to pay 5,100 for their solution. But if my customer has 100 users, they're going to pay 15,000. So 100 times 100 is 10,000 plus the 5,000 flat, that is 15,000 per month. Now this creates a de facto discount for my larger customer. So the customer with one user pays 5,100 per user, while the 100 user customer pays 150 per user. So the unit economics of my metric based fees are actually impacted by the amount of flat fees I have in my pricing model. And this can be a really good negotiation tool when you want to land pricing with your larger customers. You can say, well, you're already getting a discount from your volume because of the way we have used flat fees to really raise the initial purchase, which allows us to lower the volume fees on the metric based pricing. So they have an interplay here, which is important, especially from a negotiation standpoint. Metric based fees. Metric based fees are any fee that is charged per some unit. So $10 per user, 0.001 cent per API call or one euro per month per gigabyte stored hot or some similar there. So anything that is charged per something else per time period is a metric based fee. Now, metric based fees overall have the benefit that they allow you to scale your pricing with the customer. So large customers, whatever that means in your case, with a lot of value from the product pays more. Small customers with less value you pay less. So they're really fundamental part of the price discrimination, the method of charging more from some customers and less from others that we really want as a component in our pricing model. So pricing metrics are usually the most important element in any pricing architecture. They come in three formats. First are license-based metrics. So license-based metrics are any pricing metric where you charge upfront for the right to use something. So this the classic example is the user license. So you say, well, you want 10 users on our system, so you're going to pay for 10 users, let's say $1,000 a year each, so that is $10,000 to have 10 licenses. The customer will pay this upfront at the beginning of the period, and they will pay it regardless of their actual usage during the period. So if they only use five of these seats in your software, they still pay for 10. The benefit, of course, is you get the cash now, and two, the customer actually has incentive to adopt up to their license level. So they have incentive to push to get the 10 users on because they have paid for them, and which is actually a really good driver of license-based models. The drawback, however, is that if they don't actually adopt perfectly to exactly 10, they will feel that they are losing out. They will, at the end of the period, feel that they are being overpriced. Even if they get to only nine users, they still feel that they have paid 10% too much. And this turns into either churn or into price negotiations, so pressure in subsequent periods where they say, well, we really like your software, but you know, we only use nine users, not the full 10. So we don't really want to pay that much in the next period because we have a hard time adopting it. So you get into all these kinds of conversations and negotiations with the customer as they fail to adopt or they fail to exploit their full life. This is where usage-based metrics come in. Usage-based metrics are something that is charged at the end of a period based on the behavior or usage that the customer has with the solution. So this could, for example, be, well, get as many users on the system as you'd like. At the end of the period, we're going to count or measure how many of them were active in the software, and we're going to charge you based on active users on a usage-based metric. So you can create a hundred licenses if you like, but if only 12 of them are active, we're only gonna charge you 12 at the end of the period. Pros of a user space model is, the customer does not have to pay upfront. They like that. Second, the customer never have to pay for anything more than they use. So there isn't this discrepancy between what I pay and what I get. So we have a perfect match here, customers like that. Drawbacks are one, 
the customer doesn't pay at the start of the period. You don't get the cash up front. The customer pays at the end, which from a cash flow perspective, obviously is bad for you. Second, the customer does not, as per the license model, have a drive to adopt to a certain level. They can say, well, I have two users, I have 10, I have 25, doesn't matter. I only pay for what I get. So I don't have to push the pedal in order to actually get more users to exploit my license level to a certain degree. So they can take it in their own pace, which is fine for them, but maybe the adoption is a little bit slower than it would have been on a license based model. Thirdly, it can actually be very unpredictable for the customer what they will end up paying because usually the behavior is not very predictable. So it would say, well, if I create a hundred user licenses and then all hundred get to use it, I will pay for a hundred users, but if only five use it, I will only pay for five. So you can have a huge discrepancy at the end of the period with what you're actually gonna end up paying. This is really hard to budget for. This is really hard to plan for. And a lot of this variability, especially with larger ACV, larger annual contract values for software, this is a real part of the negotiation where most enterprise customers, most B2B customers will want some form of cap or predictability or hard estimate for what are we actually going to pay for this. So this is some of the drawbacks of the user space pricing, which is where the third kind of metric based pricing comes in the credit system. The credit system is user space pricing paid up front. Here's how it works. At the beginning of the period, I, together with my customer, estimate roughly how much uses they're going to have, how many user licenses, how many API calls, whatever it is that I charge by. Then the customer pays that in cash up front, and it sits now as credits in the account, which is spent during the time period. If they don't spend all the credits, the credits roll over to the next period. If they do spend all the credits and need to buy more, they can always increase their subscription. So the way this works is you get the cash up front, the customer will always have the sense that their purchase matches their usage so they will never overpay and you so you get the best of both worlds from both a psychological and a practical perspective credit systems however are a little bit more complicated to set up there are a little bit more terms and conditions the marketing or the sale is a little bit harder because the complexity and the time periods needs to be explained so it usually is only better for acvs that are a little higher so at least twenty five thousand dollars plus than compared to lower ones but it can actually work in lower ones and i would say that the the best example that everybody knows for credit systems is Audible. So the audiobooks, I subscribe, I get a credit every month, they accumulate in an account, summer holiday comes around, I have 10 credits, I go in, I download 80 audiobooks, and I keep my subscription rolling because I know the credits will be there whenever I need them. So this is the beauty of a credit system is that it allows you to generate recurring stable cash flow from your customers, which you can book as ARR, but the variability in the usage of the customer and the predictability is solved through this bank of credits that you have in the account. So these are the three high level components of a SaaS pricing architecture, non-recurring transactional fees, flat fees, and metric based fees. Each of them have subcomponents with varying effects, timing, pros and cons, and so forth that I walked over. I hope this video was valuable to you. Please like and subscribe. Take care.